Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the show. Apologies for the slight delay. We're waiting on a brilliant guest. Uh, you may have seen previously a brilliant lecturer from Afghanistan who, after the fall of Kabul, when the Taliban took over the capital, spoke to us firsthand about what was happening on the ground. But hopefully we will be joined with him later in the show. We have a brilliant guest I'm about to bring in, uh, first of all. Uh, but let me just give just a bit of an explanation about why we're doing this. Afghanistan now is the worst humanitarian crisis on earth. It was Yemen, which we've covered extensively. I've been to a Yemeni refugee camp. Yemen, which is uh, being bombed by the Saudi-led coalition armed and backed by the West. That was the worst humanitarian crisis. Still a horrific humanitarian crisis with millions of Yemenis on the brink of starvation. But now, tragically, Afghanistan has supplanted Yemen as the worst humanitarian crisis on earth. About n millions of Afghans face being driven into starvation. 97% um, are on the brink of extreme poverty. Now, to be clear, nobody serious is obviously an apologist for the Taliban. The Taliban now has taken over Afghanistan. This is an established fact. There are now punitive sanctions against the country. And the reason we're having this discussion is that $7 billion worth of frozen Afghan funds, which were, were frozen by the US uh, for months, which are needed if the Afghan economy has any hope of any sound, stable footing being established, uh, that's now being split um, with half of it to be given to victims of the 9-11 attacks. This is an obscenity. I mean, it's just a straightforward obscenity. It's, it's the, the greatest crime being committed right now with all too little discussion. The Afghan people are in a desperate state. They desperately need, obviously, some the, the, a, a just the basics of assistance and for an economy to be rebuilt after decades of war. And for that money, which is Afghan money, to be expropriated and given to victims of the 9-11 attacks rather than starving Afghans at the moment is obviously obscene. So we will be talking about that um, later on. As I said, we've got, uh, well, we'll be talking about that now, but we'll be talking about that firsthand uh, with uh, Abdallah uh, Bahir, uh, who will be joining us at 25 past. Um, but first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in a brilliant writer, activist, Iyad El Baghdadi. It's great to see you. How are you doing? Thank you so much for having me, Alan. It's a great honor to have you. So let me just, let's just, as I said, we'll just bring in a bit of context. So there's actually been in quite some mainstream publications. This is Foreign Affairs, Stop Starving Afghanistan, Why the West Should Release Its Economic ch Chokehold. That was back in December. As I've said, it's become, as the New Yorker says, the world's largest humanitarian crisis. More than 20 million Afghans on the brink of famine. Uh, as, it, as it reported here, 97% of the population could be plunged into extreme uh, poverty. Now, the reason, one of the many reasons I want to talk to you is uh, a tweet you did yesterday. America wouldn't let 9-11 families sue Saudi Arabia, but it's happy to steal food from the mouths of Afghan children. What an awful, disgusting, immoral move. And then you want to know why America is hemorrhaging soft power around the world. It's shit like this. And I, I, I like direct language, so that's very good. A country this immoral and hypocritical has no place on the world stage as some of universe, uh, as some sort of universalist organizing principle. So just unpack that. Tell me about what that announcement from the US and what what it what it signifies. Well, there's two parts to this, uh, Owen. Uh, there's the part about the confiscation, and there's the part of the the justification for the for the confiscation. I mean, I think, and you you covered, you know, the reason why this is so uh, egregious, brilliantly yourself, and I think uh, your Afghan guest. Of course, I'd, I'd rather if uh, if an Afghan speaks about this, and I'm I'm, I'm sure that your guest will speak about this. Uh, but then there's the second part, which is the justification. You're saying that we're going to confiscate half of that money to pay uh, the victims of, you know, the families of the victims of 9-11, when we know that, you know, Af the Af Afghan people themselves are victims of 9-11. You know, they are among the victims. Uh, their country was destroyed, 20 years of war. Uh, and not only that, it's also the hypocrisy because the, the, the American government, successive administrations, not only the Biden administration, have been protecting Saudi Arabia from being sued by, uh, you know, by the 9-11 victims, 9-11 families of 9-11 victims, 
but now you're taking money from Afghan Afghanistan, which is already starving, rather than you know uh, going after the people who are actually responsible. So it's double. It's, I mean, this is why it's not just you know it's just, it's not just disgusting and immoral, but it's also very very hypocritical. So, uh, I mean, in terms of because you you write as someone you're yourself from from Palestine. Just put this in the broader context of U.S. power, if you like, the U.S. empire and its its behavior in in the region as a whole. I mean, I, I felt, and I, I wrote about this back then in August, uh, when when the collapse, uh, you know, when the collapse actually happened, when the Taliban basically were poised to take uh, take over Afghanistan and basically declare their victory. Uh, I think that what happened in Afghanistan is going to have a long shadow uh, on on the rest of the century. Uh, it's very clear that American power is receding. Uh, it's not just a matter of uh, geopolitical realities and military might. I think America still has a very powerful military, probably the, the, the most powerful military in the world. But it's also in, in no small amount uh, a function of internal politics in, in the United States. The United States is going through its own transition. Uh, and so everybody around the world uh, is taking note. Uh, whether it is, uh, you know, terrorist groups in our own uh, region in the Middle East and North Africa, who were very uh, energized by by the Taliban's win, uh, and you know they were very happy to 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 say that you know uh, you know if the Taliban can win maybe we can too. The, I mean, literally, there 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 are those people who who's, who whose lesson the lesson they were learning from here was. Uh, you know, maybe we should also learn, launch twenty-year uh, insurgencies, brutal insurgencies against you know against, against uh, in, in in our own region. But also, everybody who is allied with the United States, uh, feeling like you know, so long we you know, so long we have we're allied with the United States, that means we don't have to care. We don't have to care about embracing our people or making peace with our region. Of course, it's also piqued their own anxiety as well. Uh, so it is you know, Afghanistan, unfortunately, uh, uh, is, you know, is kind of ground zero for this, uh, this very large event, which really, uh, you know, foretells a lot about the rest of the, uh, the rest of the century. As unfortunately, it's, uh, um, uh, you know, I feel that this so-called world, liberal world order or the, the, the world order here was built in a way to exclude us. And as it is collapsing, it is also collapsing on top of our heads. What, what, I mean, how do you see this playing out? I mean, what, one thing, obviously, which will, you know, when I tweet about this, you get these responses as well. People say, look, the Taliban is a brutal, sadistic uh, regime. How can the West possibly give money uh, to Afghanistan, given the nature of this regime? Uh, this won't help the Afghan people. I mean, that's the standard response you get from people on Twitter. And I've, I've seen you, I've, I look for your mentions, you've been, You've had lots of people saying the same thing. Yeah. What would you, how would you respond to that? I mean, being anti-starvation is not being pro-Taliban. It's that simple. I mean, be, being against the starvation, the mass starvation of an entire an entire country is not being pro-Taliban. It's a human position. It's not an it's not a pro-Taliban position. And uh, you know, the whole point of saying that you know we uh, uh, you know we shouldn't give the money to the Taliban. The Taliban is the government is the government of uh, of Afghanistan, whether you like it or not. I mean, it was America and, you know, her, uh, you know, I think primarily America, primarily the Biden administration that decided, really decided that, you know, enough is enough and we're going to pull out. And yeah, this means that Afghanistan is going to fall to the Taliban and we're fine with it because, you know, uh, there's, there's no alternative to us. So if, if America itself created the situation where, where the Taliban become the, the, the you know, the, the, the de facto government of Afghanistan, it can't turn around and say, yeah, because it is if, if, because they are now the, the, the de facto government, we have to kind of boycott them and sanction them, etc. Afghans are starving. They need at least, you know, they need their money. It's not just a matter of the of, you know, not having food. It's that there's no cash in the country. There's, these are foreign reserves. You know, they're basically back the currency. There's no cash. There's no currency. Uh, so so long people don't have the money, they can't buy anything. What do you think the demand should be of people in the West at the moment in terms of, because at the moment, the you know, people's attention has been distracted by what's happening in Eastern Europe, obviously with the Russian buildup in Ukraine about the question marks about whether that's going to be the coming flashpoint. What kind of demands do you think people should be putting on their own governments at the moment? 
So, of course, I would defer to your Afghan uh, guest on this, uh, and he's going to speak uh, hopefully in a little in a little bit, and he'll, I, I'm sure that he's much more qualified to 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 speak about this. Uh, but I do believe that I think uh, you're absolutely right that you know everybody's attention is elsewhere now. Uh, this this whole disaster in Afghanistan really has happened when the world is already dealing with so many big events. Already, we're already in, in the middle of the of a pandemic, uh, and unfortunately, people who are weak, uh, the people who are marginalized, the people who are weaker, and the people who are oppressed are always forgotten. I think what you're doing, Owen, here by platforming. Uh, Afghan voices, uh, retweeting Afghan voices, elevating Afghan voices. I think that that goes a long way. And I think if if we simply say that this should not be forgotten, this should be em emphasized, this should be in the media, this should be front page news. I think that itself is probably the the minimum that we can do. Just finally, because about to bring in um, our brilliant next guest, uh, who will be talking firsthand, as you as you say, as 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 an Afghan about what's actually happening on the ground in Afghanistan. I mean, do you think there's any prospect of a? I mean, because there has been quite a lot of outrage about the decision, which, and I do think this is quite it, quite an important point, uh, because I said yesterday uh, that I it was so hideous what the Biden administration has done that I couldn't think of a single a single worst thing, so an individual thing, that Trump did that was worse. And I genuinely cannot. That caused a lot of outrage but from, from various people. But the point I was making there, really, was if this was Donald Trump who'd done this, I actually think there would have been wall-to-wall -wall was... moral outrage. Absolutely. But because it's a Democratic president, I mean, this is, you know, it's, it's like this idea, Democrats are less hawkish. Well, tell that to Vietnam. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 that's a problem, isn't it? There isn't sufficient outrage because Biden doing what Trump, what if Trump had done it, would have been a very different response. It kind of reminds me of, a, of, of, of an Iranian friend who was talking about uh, doing human rights activism in Iran or on Iran, the subject of Iran. Uh, and, and, and she was like, when we have a terrible president, it's easier for us to speak about human rights because everybody is outraged, you know? The moment you have, you know, someone who's who's more, you know, who has more a smiling face and moderate face, uh, you know, they can do the exact thing or even worse, and nobody's outraged because, you know, they he, he he's smiling at least, you know. Um, look, in the end, unfortunately, I think the U.S. administration is still handling this as if it is a PR problem. Uh, in fact, they released a statement, um, I think, on White, WhiteHouse.gov, and they're they're explaining the legality of the move, why it is, you know, how it is legally justified. But then it doesn't matter. I mean, they're still thinking, oh, they, we actually took the right decision, and the only problem is that it has not been communicated properly. They still are unable to engage with the basic immorality of the entire situation. And unfortunately, I think this is not going to change. Yeah, it's great to great to have you on on the show and to have the right amount, I think, of moral indignation at what is a terrible crime being committed in all of our names by the US primarily, but its allies as well. So thank you so, so much for joining us. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Honored. Take care. Take care. Um, brilliant to have Iyad on the show. We're about to bring in our next brilliant guest who you will, for those of us that who watch or listen to the podcast, uh, will be aware. If you're watching live, click on the YouTube link and press like and subscribe. Uh, you can put questions to the guests using Super Chat. I'll read out at the end. I forgot to do that last week. I'm a terrible person. Um, we, uh, You can support us on patreon.com forward slash I'm Joe's 84. I have been very distracted with the book, which I'm finishing now. Uh, definitely, as I'm telling my editor and everybody else. Uh, sending in a chapter a day at the moment. I'm get, making a lot of progress. So we're going to go back to doing our documentaries. Um, I've posted on Patreon asking for ideas for what we should do documentaries about. People are posting their ideas. You can do that as well. We will decide based on your suggestions. So we will go on that basis. Um, and we've got lots of interviews. We, we did lots of regular interviews with various thinkers, activists, politicians. We'll be doing far more of those. Now I'm back in London and finally finishing my book. Let's bring in our next fantastic guests. It's great to see you again. And I, though before we start, I think I got your... The, I, I've been stressing about this. I'm not going to lie. I, I think I got your name wrong last time you were on the show. So I'm going to sit... I think I did, because it is... 
Op, it's, no, you, I, I was actually going to pronounce it, but I'm going to get it wrong. So I'll let you pronounce your own name if that's okay. Look, it's actually very simple. It's a sentence, obey the law. You know how you're supposed to obey the law. So just say that in the past tense. So obey the law, right? Obey so the law. I remember that. Yeah. That's all yeah. come flooding back. That's what you told me last time. Uh, yeah. Not something I strictly abide by as a commandment, but I will... <laughs> I will I will abide by that for the purposes of your name. It's great to see you again. We last saw you in August. Firstly, I hope you're well. Um, let's just start. Let's just, in terms of, uh, firstly, just your response to the move by the US administration to take half of Afghan's assets and give it to the victims, American victims of 9-11. That's, I think, an important point which he had emphasized. What's your response to that as, as, as somebody, obviously, Afghanistan is your home. What's your response? Outrage, uh, just one word. Um, look, you mentioned Vietnam earlier. We have to understand that this is the same Biden who, when he was a senator, he had voted against a bill uh, to help evacuate uh, US allies from uh, South Vietnam. Um, he was this Biden then, he is the same Biden now. Um, he had was lobbying for ending the Afghan war. And the question wasn't about ending the Afghan war because we see eye to eye on that matter. It's about how he did it and what he has been following it up with. I mean, this money, for starters, is Afghanistan's money. It doesn't belong to any government. We saw the ex-president of Afghanistan, Hamid Karzai, give a press conference yesterday saying he was there when this fund was being established and, and piling up. So was the president after him. And now the Taliban are there. None of these three entities own this money. This is Afghanistan's money that was supposed to be under lock and key in the U.S. and be controlled by the Afghan Central Bank. Um, it's wrong on so many levels, right? So he's uh, the Biden administration really tried to play it smart and your your guest Baghdadi covered it very well and it's quite odd when you say Baghdadi I know he doesn't like that because it makes him sound like the other Baghdadi but um, I mean the Biden administration announces saying oh we've done this wonderful thing where we've unfrozen half of the assets to be sent in the form of aid first problem because we don't want it in the form of aid foreign reserves aren't meant to be given to a country back in the form of aid aid is short term for foreign reserves are meant for trade in the backing of the currency um and a gazillion other issues i as an aid organ as an aid worker or someone who leads his own effort of distributing fresh bread in afghanistan every day or will refuse to take that money on principal basis because this is very frankly screwing over my country. Um, and the second half of it being, which they didn't mention, but they uh, in the initial press release, it, it has been put on hold for the decision of the court with regards to the 9-11 compensation. I mean, you know, Owen, Afghanistan has given thousands of lives we have orphans widows any bomb you name it that the united states has was dropped on the country detention centers uh the first cia detainees killed uh in torture all of those are american legacies in afghanistan if there is a country that should be asking for reparations should be afghanistan you can't have the richest country in the world turning to the worst humanitarian crisis hit country and ask it for compensation. It's not right. Uh, it's not legitimate, moral. Uh, it's not even legal. Uh, but we are trying to pursue our, all paths and hoping that uh, the will of the people and the ruckus we can create can, can sort of push Biden and the Biden administration to think it over, even though I don't think there is a lot to think over and not much to turn back on. Um, the hope would be to uh, win the court case, um, but then there is no plaintiff. There's no one to represent Afghanistan uh, in the case. Uh, he had message to say, I'm the good Baghdadi. Um, uh, uh, so in terms of the actual situation on the ground in Afghanistan at the moment, because there are various reports in the media, I have to say it's not getting the attention it deserves, given the culpability of the West, as you've mentioned, the 20 years before this 
directly on the ground, obviously before that as well, the 1980s onwards, he, and, and now the, the sanctions and the confiscation of assets. How bad is the situation back in Afghanistan at the moment? Uh, I mean, I never imagined, Do you know how you, um, I'm growing up, I used to watch the, there was, there was a concert held for Africa because, and, and they had this thing where they would snap their finger every three seconds saying one child dies in Africa every three seconds from hunger. And I, it was so unbelievable to me because uh, you wouldn't think that in the modern world today. I mean, you turn to people like Steven Pinker and they turn around and say that, oh, we've progressed as a collective being and there are no more famines or large scale wars anymore. And I think that's a very bad measure to hold to begin with. But um, that being said, I mean, the first time we found out about a girl called Ruqya in north of Afghanistan who was in a hospital, she was wasting. So wasting is the extreme end of malnutrition where your body starts eating itself up. So you're more of a skeleton. Um, and just seeing Ruqya and, and helping her eventually made me realize how crazy all of this was. And sometimes people ask, they're like, oh, you guys keep saying 10 million people supposedly are going to die of hunger. But like, do you see people dying of hunger on the roads? Because that's not how it works uh, in today's world. You don't, the change is very exponential. So you don't have a job for a month, for two months, three months. And eventually one day, every source of income that you could have had is gone right? Uh, there is no money even to ask of anyone. I mean, I'm a lecturer. I am one of the top 1% in Afghanistan. I haven't been able to access my money for the past six months, because if you go to the banks, because there's no cash in the economy. And this is a separate issue from the Federal Reserves, because our cash used to get printed, I think, in Poland. Um, and that cash had to be transferred to the country. And that movement has stopped since the Taliban have come to power. So we have no new currency coming into uh, the country. Um, so there's there are so many issues if we start counting them. But yes, you're right. The problem with the world today is that media is uh, directed towards different issues. I think there's a quotation that says, the United States doesn't lose wars, it loses interest. And when the United States loses interest, the international media loses interest. I mean, the amount of uh, media requests people like me used to get back in the day when uh, the Republic was still uh, in Afghanistan and the Taliban hadn't taken over compared to what we get now is a very fair measure of how much that story sells uh, anymore. And this is considering that this is the worst humanitarian crisis in modern history, full stop. And yet this is what we live in. When you hear people in the West say, we can't, these sanctions are necessary. The Taliban is a horrific regime and therefore any money will go to the Taliban. It won't help the Afghan people. We can't provide support for the, Af for the Taliban regime. What's your response when you hear that? Because that's the standard response you get all over social media and a lot of politicians and commentators. I sometimes, it's quite odd that I'm going to use the Taliban example here, right? Um, one issue that we've had with uh, the Taliban, and since we talked in August, we've done so much uh, in trying to create more organic footing um, to what we want, and and as a as, as an opposition um, or or civil society to be um, dealt with uh, by the Taliban, um, is a lot of times the Taliban do certain things, and we look at it and. And, and we're shocked because we don't understand how it could make sense for them to do what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And very often the Taliban feel the same way about the civil society of Afghanistan. And the idea is that both of us are looking at the same situation from completely different lenses. Um, and I think that the current situation with what Biden did and when I see the response from Americans, uh, I think that they're seeing the same issue, but very differently. And the gap of information or the disinformation that exists really harms the cause. I mean, 
none of us is happy that the Taliban came to power. All of us were arguing for democracy, for human rights, and what have you. The Taliban won, right? How did they won? That's a whole other debate as well. But the United States just turned its back and said, if I don't see it happen, you can do whatever you want to. Taliban are in power now. Now, I'll put my academic hat on here, and I've written extensively on how sanctions basically don't work, and you have plenty of examples from Saddam's Iraq to Khomeini's uh, Iran, um, where basically the government never gets hurt. But uh, a counter-narrative of that is uh, sanctions work, but it's not the implementation of sanctions, just the threat of sanctions that is the effective tool. Um, that works sort of when you have a population that you're hoping to rise up and resist the regime. Afghanistan's situation right now has such a bad power asymmetry that no matter how much the grievance of Afghans is, the capabilities are off, right? Which means that the Afghan population, A, doesn't have that great grievances with the Taliban compared to what the Republic had done to them 20 years ago. And when I say the Afghan population, there is obviously a division between the urban educated elite, such as myself, whose lives have drastically changed and the larger rural population who really don't care as long as the large scale killing has stopped. Um, and that too is a failure of the past 20 years, the fact that their lives never changed and they never got to see anything out of democracy. So, I mean, um, in such a situation, I keep saying that they're standing on our breathing pipe, the oxygen pipe, and they're trying to give us CPR. I mean, the fact that when I'm doing aid work, I have to jump through 20 loopholes to eventually get the money into Afghanistan should show you how crazy it is that you're trying to prevent the worst humanitarian crisis with, with the worst kind of sanctions you could have placed on a country, right? Um, if there is no cash in the economy, if there is no way people can earn money, the situation is getting far worse, far quicker than any aid can address, right? And we're not willing to have that long-term discussion. And I know um, it's confusing because you're like, then what are you proposing? And I think that's an important question to ask anyone on the table right now who's willing to talk about the issue. And the, the, the solution is two things, right? And the idea is we've arrived at a post-conflict state. For better or worse, the war is over within Afghanistan. Now, how do we use that? And a bitter reality exists. That is the Taliban, right? Um, organically, let us Afghans sit down and try to be acknowledged by the Taliban, try to push the Taliban on major issues. And we've done so. We've gone, gotten small wins and we're creating larger national discourse. This is what we should have done the past 20 years. The fact that this bit was missing meant everything that had been achieved was so superficial that it collapsed and not sparing any blame to the United States and its allies. And on the second end, the international community, the international community has so much leverage to use against the Taliban. And it's like this very simple thread that you're holding that you can keep pulling because the Taliban leadership are still scared of being droned and being on those um, lists. Uh, the Taliban leadership still know that they need these reserves and need some sort of engagement and recognition to not become pariahs and actually exist in the international context. And you don't achieve that by doing grandstanding politics, right? You don't achieve that by saying, if you don't do this, I will not engage with you at all. So these binaries are the problem. If you can't just switch off, I mean, opting out of the Taliban, oh, it might be a luxury you can afford because you can just turn around and maybe turn off alerts about Afghanistan or the Taliban. Afghan citizens cannot. If we do truly live in a global world, then if we have a moral responsibility towards the funds, you can turn a blind eye on the country. And that means engagement with the Taliban. If we Afghans are forced to do it, the international community should sit down with them as well, use these leverages, push for better outcomes, help us, the organic civil society of Afghanistan, by backing us subtly. Don't make us look like we don't have agency and we're your proxies for achieving a, a, a Western goal but 
support us in doing what is better. I mean, hungry Afghans, uneducated Afghans aren't going to care for their rights, right? They're going to care for being fed. We should care about their education. In the long run, Afghanistan will improve itself. The Taliban are a symptom of a much larger problem that was never addressed in the past 20 years. Just finally, how do you see this playing out? What do you think is likely to happen? And what kind of demands would you like people in the West, not just the US, in Britain as well, other places like that, what demands to put on their own governments? Uh, I mean, I'm in the US right now and I'm meeting policymakers uh, trying to push for uh, better policies towards Afghanistan, trying to give them uh, a realistic uh, picture of what's happening on the ground. Um, like your earlier guest said, uh, whatever you say, everything that people put out there creates momentum, helps us get a, a more exposure to our voices. But then again, you're also responsible to turn towards your representatives and communicate um, what sort of world do you want to live in? I mean, do you seriously... I, I mean, I, I love... Um, uh, what was uh, Peter Singer's argument um, about the drowning child and how you can't morally pass a drowning child by and not help get them out even if you're wearing a very expensive suit or even if you're getting late for the most important meeting in your life. Mm -hmm. The Afghan nation is starving today. The Afghan people have been left in the open to deal with a very drastic change in the way a whole generation, 20 years of war, there are one third of, or I think two thirds of Afghanistan's population is below 20 years, which means two thirds of Afghanistan never saw what happened on 9-11. And that population is being made to pay for something that no Afghan was involved in. Right. Or let's, for the sake of argument, say the Taliban were involved in. But then on one side, you're saying I'm not going to release these reserves because I don't recognize the Taliban as a government. But then I'm going to take these reserves because I won't I want to make the Taliban pay. I mean, you can't have it both ways. Um, so, yeah, just raise your voices, contact your local representatives and hear us hear us get the story right before you can make assumptions. But our hope in general is that somehow we can legally pursue this matter and show that the United States cannot sign off on this money and choose to do with it. This is a horrible precedent. And I'm hoping that other countries can open their eyes because someday they're going to be on the United States bad books. Someday their money that they've parked in the New York banks is going to be mishandled the way that it's being done to Afghanistan. I mean, yes, the West lost in Afghanistan, but there's no need to be so vindictive and malicious about it. Um, yeah. Abedala, that was brilliant stuff. Uh, very, very, very compelling and searing stuff about a, a huge crime which is being committed right now in the names of everybody in the West. Uh, it's so great to, again to have your voice to explain so brilliantly, so eloquently what's actually happening and the facts. Um, so it's such an honor to have you again. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure being on your show. Wishing great. you all the best. Take care. Speak soon. Cheers. Brilliant stuff. Very, very lucky to have him uh, explain firsthand in a way I'm afraid many Western outlets are not giving a proper platform to the voices that we need to be hearing right now. Um, before we wrap up, I've got a couple of things to talk about other than Afghanistan, which I hope people keep at the forefront of their minds. There's a lot going on, obviously, at the moment in the East. I just want to talk, because we are used to talking about, I'm afraid, on this show and in my writings, about essentially how the bad guys tend to win. I'll generally get away with anything. You know, they've, they've, they, they, the terrible un injustices been committed by those with power. And there is, generally speaking, very, very few repercussions for them, whether it be what's happening to Afghanistan at the moment, what happened to Iraq, 
uh, whether it be austerity, all of these people who've committed terrible injustices on Britain and on foreign countries, very few consequences. And yet this week, there were a couple of striking exceptions to this rule. The first, of course, was Cressida Dick, the, uh, I was going to say former, but not quite yet. She's resigning as commissioner of the Metropolitan Police after essentially being forced out by uh, the London mayor, Sadiq Khan. Let's have a little look at the video Sadiq Khan did where he talks about Cressida Dick's resignation, which he kind of forced. I want to talk directly to Londoners about an issue of great importance for our city. The recent shocking report by the Independent Office for Police Conduct, which uncovered clear evidence of racism, sexism, homophobia, bullying, discrimination and misogyny by police officers, has further shattered public trust and confidence in the Metropolitan Police Service. In this country, we police by consent. And when trust in the police breaks down to the extent it has, that model and therefore public safety is put at risk. Last week, I made clear to the Metropolitan Police Commissioner the scale of the change I believe is urgently required to rebuild the trust and confidence of Londoners in the Met and to root out racism, sexism, homophobia, bullying, discrimination and misogyny that still exists. I'm not satisfied with the Commissioner's response. It's clear that the only way to start to deliver the scale of the change required is to have new leadership right at the top of the Metropolitan Police. Now, I think it's really important that we emphasise that this is a systemic issue that doesn't absolve people of individual agency. Um, I mean, I, it's quite a nuanced conversation that in a sense, isn't it? Because Cressida Dick has, you know, the list of, you know, awful things we could hold her to account for are pretty long. Not least, of course, the killing of John Charles de Menendez, a Brazilian electrician, completely innocent, who was shot dead in 2005, repeatedly shot in the head on the London Underground in front of huge numbers of terrified passengers. Um, the reason I raise this is um, the New Yorker had a piece uh, about Cressida Dick's resignation, which was just astonishing, to be honest with you. Um, essentially, you know, it says here, listen to this, but until now, Dick's experience and symbolic importance protected her. She started out as a Bobby, a beat cop in 983. Dick is gay, and her partner is also a police officer. In 2005, Dick was in charge of the counter-terrorism team that killed John Charles de Menendez, a Brazilian man, on the tube after mistaking him for a suicide bomber. Dick has always handled that momentous error with dignity and grace. The idea of a female leader, Britain's largest police force, gestured at the kind of society and policing that a city like London might aspire to, but the symbol has been undone by the reality. Wait a fucking minute. Sorry, grace, dignity and grace, a momentous error. That's one way of describing uh, pursuing a completely innocent man uh, and then shooting him in the head repeatedly uh, for no, for, for, with no basis, uh, you know, injustice whatsoever. Uh, dignity and grace. Do you, know, do you know what the Metropolitan Police did to John Charles Menendez afterwards, after they shot him repeatedly in the head? Uh, just by him being completely innocent of anything. Uh, they then they then waged the Metropolitan Police a smear campaign against him. They made up a pack of lies because the Metropolitan Police excel at lying. That's one thing they're great at, lying. They lie a lot. So what they did when they shot dead, this innocent man repeatedly shot him in the head, is they then claimed that he was aggressive. No, he wasn't. He was on drugs. No, he wasn't. That he vaulted. Uh, he jumped over the barriers, which people still widely believe, by the way. No, he didn't. Uh, they claimed that he, uh, they repeatedly challenged him and and said that, you know, they had a gun and they warned him, uh, which is interesting because every single police officer there claimed that was the case. But weirdly, not a single of the 20 witnesses who watched it happen, every single one of them says that never happened. But it's weird how the officers all got together somehow and just all came up with the same story, which completely contradicts the eyewitness report of anybody else. They then mocked up a picture of John Charles Menendez. They manipulated an image to try and make it look like he was one of the suspected attempted suicide bombers back in 2005. Dignity and fucking grace. Goodness grief. Goodness grief. Um, clearly, and we did a whole show on this, do check it out, where we interviewed a former police officer 
as, a, as an example, but we, 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 we looked in depth, obviously, at the record of the Metropolitan Police, the corruption, the racism, the misogyny, and the homophobia. And actually, it's interesting that because what's useful about Cressida Dick, she does have a, a use, as it turns out, is actually she shows how a kind of liberal interpretation of identity politics, um, and I'm not using identity politics as a general pejorative, obviously, it's used as a pejorative to stigmatize the struggle of women and of minorities for their rights and dignity. Um, and their liberation. I, I'm using it where people go, well, we've got a girl boss, we've got a gay woman at the top of the Metropolitan Police Service, so how can it be homophobic and misogynistic? Clearly, it, a structural problem is not solved by who the figurehead happens to be. In her case, somebody who just reflexively backed a corrupt institution rather than actually doing anything to confront the institutional problems, institutional problems, sorry, now I'm understating the problem, uh, the institutional uh, injustices uh, within the metropolitan uh, police force because the homophobia, we saw that with the victims uh, of Stephen Port, uh, the so-called grinder serial killer, gay men who were killed, the police did not act properly because they were gay and that's what the families have spoken out of the uh, of the victims, they called it institutional homophobia, quite correctly so. Um, misogyny, we've seen that of course, not just obviously with the vigil of Sarah Everard, killed by a Metropolitan Police Officer, uh, being attacked by the police. It's interesting that, isn't it? Oh, the police will go in there and heavy uh, if there's women uh, who are doing a vigil for a woman murdered by a Metropolitan Police Officer. Not quite so heavy when Downing Street was getting pissed over and over again. The same Downing Street, which has lots of Metropolitan Police Officers in it. Oh, they didn't didn't seem to didn't seem to roll out then when the law was actually being systematically broken by the most powerful people in the country. Uh, but there's also the evidence of sexual abuse, uh, uh, domestic violence committed by police officers and often the action not taken uh, against those police officers. Racism, where do you even begin? Where do you even, where do you even start? Uh, you know, it, it, it's, the racist stop and search has actually got worse under Cressida Dick in terms of the disproportionate targeting of black people for stop and search. Um, for example, on suspicion of possessing drugs, even though statistically black people are actually less likely to take drugs than white people, we could go on. The fact that Cressida Dick was a gay woman at the top of the Metropolitan Police Force is completely and utterly irrelevant. She did not. I, the idea of a female leader, this is what the, I'll just repeat again what it said, the New Yorker, of Britain's largest police force gestured at the kind of society and policing that a city like London might aspire to. Cressida Dick is what London should aspire to. Somebody who did nothing to confront the institutional, you know, I mean, the institutional uh, racism and misogyny and homophobia and corruption and actually obstructed measures to deal with them and didn't cooperate properly with inquiries uh, into these appalling uh, injustices within the Metropolitan Police Force. Goodness grief. I'm sorry, but there we go. It's important to have a rant about that. I just want to just flag another thing, which is what's been going on this week with Labour. Because as I've said, generally speaking, bad people in Britain get away with most things, very few consequences. Another exception was, and this is just appalling, Neil Coyle, uh, who has been suspended after allegations of racist comments made by a journalist. We're talking about sinophobia, by the way, which is a form of racism which has proliferated in the COVID era and there's not been enough to talk about it. And I don't want to just make this all about Neil Coyle uh, at, at this outset, this point about racism, because, you know, sinophobia, you know, we've seen attacks on people of Chinese origin, Chinese appearance, people, not, you know, unfortunately racist uh, are obviously indiscriminate with who they target. So they will go after people who often obviously aren't even of Chinese origin, but the huge numbers of racist attacks, racist abuse being suffered by uh, people of Chinese or Asian heritage in Britain and in the West and, and beyond. And, and Neil Coyle was accused of racially being racist, making racist comments towards a brilliant, very well-respected young journalist in Westminster. Now, a lot of people then said, some journalists said, Neil Coyle's, because Neil Coyle had been banned as well, he'd been suspended already from parliamentary bars after swearing repeatedly um, at a Labour staffer. And then allegedly, when a Conservative MP intervened to calm him down, Neil Coyle yelled at him, um, fuck off and lose some weight. Lovely, lovely stuff. It, now, Neil Coyle is, you know, when people said, oh, well, why wasn't action taken? Because people know, you know, 
Left Out, which was another book about the Corbyn era, went into the abuse, the, the constant messages that Neil Collins sent to Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, it's not the only politician he that I'm aware of that Neil Collins spammed with uh, completely ridiculous and sometimes well just out of order messages. Um, uh, but they were like, well, why wasn't action taken? Everyone's known about it. Well, why wasn't it reported then? <laughs> Why, why have all these journalists suddenly gone, well, we all knew about Neil Coyle. Well, why didn't he say anything then? Um, and I think the point about Neil Coyle is, uh, this is, I'm afraid, a point I'm going to make, is that faction of the Labour Party, the kind of right of the Labour Party, in, are some of the most unpleasant people I've met in my entire life. You know, I've, I've, I've been around politics in a formal sense, for 17 years. I am a geriatric millennial. I started working in Parliament in 2005. I met some very unpleasant people, people who, you know, it, it was humiliating to have to share the same oxygen with them. Um, but some of the most unpleasant, personally unpleasant people I've always met are on the Labour right, people who are so venomous and nasty. And you just wonder, why did you get into politics? What what's, What makes your heart beat a bit faster? Is it ending poverty and injustice it doesn't seem that with a lot of them it seems actually just hating the left has become their all defining personality and the reason you see we haven't had neil coyle's terrible behavior being properly reported on before is because um the rules of british politics are if you're abusive to the left then <laughs> fine <laughs> there are no consequences now in this particular case he made the mistake of being racist towards a young very well-respected journalist in Westminster. Um, but the, the sort of behaviour on display, which I've seen, which I've been on the receiving end, just general abuse from right-wing Labour MPs in person uh, and via text message or whatever, just horrible, horrible behaviour, horrible behaviour. It is embarrassing to support the same political party as these people uh, or be in the same political party, which I know a lot of people think I'm completely delusional to continue supporting <laughs> on the, on those grounds. What can I say? I'm a sucker. Um, another point, which just while we're on this subject of the Labour Party, it's been reported in the Sunday Times that, I'll just read it out. There's no. This is about Jeremy Corbyn. There's no mechanism available to deselect him other than the trigger mechanism under which his local party would have to vote for a new contest, which he would then have to lose. As a popular local MP, this will not pose a threat to him. However, a senior party insider said, we are determined to bring this to a head. The current position is not sustainable. A source close to Sir Keir Starmer said there was no chance he would bring back Corbyn and that his time in the Labour Party was effectively over. Even if Corbyn apologises for his comments, as was demanded by Nick Brown, the former chief whip, it is understood that the party would find a pretext for continuing his suspension. At least they're honest. When he was suspended at the time, uh, some of Keir Starmer's advisors briefed the media that this was their clause for moment. That does not sound like they were actually driven then, were they, suspending him by being affronted by the comments he made. But they were actually saying, well, actually, here's an opportunity to, you know, kind of have a kind of, uh, you know, we've, we've completely purged ourselves of Corbynism. This is a new political party. Um, you know, Keir Starmer served, obviously, in the shadow cabinet. He was appointed by Jeremy Corbyn. He supposedly campaigned to make him prime minister. In the leadership contest, positioned himself as Corbynism uh, with, with competence and unity, essentially, professionalised. But uh, he called the 2017 manifesto his foundational document. When he was asked on national television whether he'd nationalised gas or energy, uh, he, he stuck and utilities. He stuck his hand up, and uh, you know he committed to a whole series of policy pledges from defending migrants' rights, etc., which he has abandoned. Um, it is the biggest, as Matt Zarb cousin, um, who is the former spokesperson for Jeremy Corbyn, but the biggest political heist in history. I know people go, "Why don't you focus your fire on the Tories?" Have a look at my last YouTube videos; they're all on the Tories. We can talk about Labour as well. Uh, I mean, it is astonishing the level of dishonesty. Uh, that this person stood for party leader on a completely false prospectus. And the reason he's got away with it, it goes back to the Neil Coyle point, is the rules of British politics are you can be as dishonest or abusive or whatever as you want, as long as there's the left on the receiving end. So a lot of journalists know that Keir Starmer stood on a completely dishonest platform. He's reneged on what he said he would be. But they, 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 they like that because they, they, their view is, well... You know, they have a huge burning antipathy towards the left. So their view is the left fair game. Do what you want to them. And I just think, you know, in terms of where we go from here, 
the people around Keir Starmer, I'm, I'm sorry to say, some of them who I know, and I've known a lot of Keir, some of Keir Starmer's close allies I've known most of my adult life, uh, they don't have a vision for the country other than um, a, 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 often a kind of burning hatred towards the left. So they keep doing these things now. The reason that they're, they're doing this now, and Keir Starmer did this tub-thumping, uh, you know, neocon article, essentially, on foreign policy, I mean, because he's positioning himself, people don't like it when I said this, to the right of Joe Biden, uh, including on foreign policy, which given what Joe Biden's doing at the moment is, is not great. Just a hawkish, tub-thumping, rah-rah-rah NATO kind of article. Um, they're doing all this now because the Tories have set themselves on fire, so they have political space as they see it to go after the left and define themselves against the left. That's why they're picking this fight about Corbyn. That's why they're doing this foreign policy stuff. Uh, you know, what they're trying to do is use this to go, well, we've got an opinion poll lead, which has nothing to do with anything they've done. It's because the Tories have set themselves on fire. Um, but now we're going to use this as an opportunity to kind of legitimize and cement the marginalization and humiliation of the left within the Labour Party and within British politics. That's transparently what they're doing at the moment. Now, in terms of the polling, I mean, a new poll's just come out which shows Labour with a three-point lead. That was based on them changing the methodology. Uh, Servation, or was it a Servation opinion? I'll check. I think it was opinion, actually. They changed the methodology. So you might think, well, fair enough. I mean, that Labour's still ahead, and they've changed the methodology. Actually, the old methodology gives Labour a much bigger lead. But the reason the new methodology is important is it takes into account that the shift in the Tory position, the decline in Tory polling has overwhelmingly been driven by Tory voters going to don't know. So the new polling methodology takes that into account and actually therefore hands Labour only a three point lead. Now, an another poll which has come out. Here we go. Let me just here we go. This is um, who would make the best prime minister. Keir Starmer, 26 percent, down five points. Boris Johnson, 24 points, minus one. Uh, 49% said don't know, That's gone or none of these, that's gone up by five points. I would say, by the way, who'd make the best prime minister, I'd say Keir Starmer. So, I mean, even that 26% includes people like myself, who I'm afraid to say has utter contempt for Keir Starmer, but would still prefer Keir Starmer in, a, in, a, in, a, in an open contest uh, to Boris Johnson, because obviously, you know... I'm not like the anti-Corbyn people who delighted in watching the Labour Party defeated when their guy wasn't in charge. I would still take a Labour government over a Conservative government. Of course I would. Uh, to be tied, essentially, with Boris Johnson. Boris, At the moment, Keir Starmer's tied with Boris Johnson about who'd make the best Prime Minister. What does he have to do? What does Boris Johnson have to do? I mean, he's it, it, literally it being investigated by the police. He's repeatedly broken the law. He's lied to the British public. There's a massive cost of living crisis. So I do look at Labour's position, particularly given Boris Johnson's going to get thrown overboard at some point and replaced with someone else, and think they should be pretty worried because they're not offering a compelling vision for the country other than let's go and attack the left. Anyway, um, I think we're done now. Um, lots of love, everybody. Thanks for joining us. So as I've said, we are going to, um, we're going to, now that I'm finishing my book, we're going to be doing our documentary. So if you sign up on patreon.com forward slash ownjones84, you can suggest what we should do and we will do one of those and then another one next month. Uh, we've got lots of interviews coming up. Uh, do suggest those as well. Um, and uh, I will... I will see you next Sunday, obviously, 12 o'clock, but we've got lots of stuff to come, and it's all thanks to your support. Those were brilliant guests. It was particularly important to have, obviously, an Afghan perspective on what's happening in Afghanistan right now. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, press like before you go. Press like. And, oh, Tad's just jumped in, just saying Tad is a regular. The statement by Starmer on uh, Northern Ireland to say they would campaign in favour of staying in the UK to the right of Blair, who helped the peace process, was a pointless exercise in flag waving. Yeah, I mean, that's just another striking example. It's like, look how unionist I am, campaigning for Northern Ireland to stay. I mean, that's again, that was not something Tony Blair himself said. Anyway, good point, Tad. Um, we've got lots of stuff to come. Do press like and subscribe. I am looking forward to see you all uh, very soon. Um, take care. Lots of love. Bye.